Let's continue our applications of derivatives in section 4.3, considering monotonic functions in the first derivative test. So we're taking a pretty big step forward and getting an idea of how to use calculus to graph a function using first derivative information. You know first derivatives uh, at individual points give slopes of tangent lines, and that's the real idea behind what goes on in this section. So we use the first derivative of a function to determine where a function is increasing or decreasing, and we use that information to determine where the function has its extrema, its maxes and mins. This information we'll use to graph the function. In the next section, we'll have um, even more information that'll allow us to give an even more detailed graph of a function. But this is the place to start in terms of using calculus to graph functions. Uh, going back to uh, section 1.1, we had the definition of uh, an increasing and decreasing function as follows. Let f be a function defined on an interval i, then f is said to be increasing on that interval if for any x1 and x2 in the interval with f of x1 less than at x, excuse me, with x1 less than x2, then f of x1 is less than f of x2. So you put in uh, greater x values, you get out greater function values. In terms of a picture, increasing looks something like this. I move to the right on input values and I go up on output values. Whenever x2 is greater than x1, f of x2 is greater than f of x1, the function must be going uphill. It's an increasing function when read from left to right. You read it from right to left and everything's backwards, but the numbers are laid out in increasing order from left to right. So we read from left to right. F is said to be decreasing on this interval if for all points X1 and X2 in the interval with X1 less than X2, we get a reversal here. F of X1 is greater than F of X2. So what that means in terms of the picture here is you put in greater x values and you get out lesser function values. So the graph must look something like this. The function's decreasing when read from left to right. Uh, and a function that's increasing or decreasing on an interval is called a monotonic function on that interval. It's part of the title of the section. We'll talk increasing and decreasing a great deal. Monotone and monotonic, we probably won't talk about that too much. That's just a term we won't use very much. Uh, but increasing and decreasing, we'll use a great deal. Now, you might not be surprised to learn, since the derivative gives slopes of tangent lines, we can use the derivative to determine where a differentiable function is increasing and decreasing. Not surprisingly, we can relate increasing and decreasingness of a function to its derivative. And that's what corollary 4.3, the first derivative test for increasing and decreasing states. Suppose we have a function continuous on the closed interval from A to B and differentiable on the open interval from A to B. So it doesn't have to be differentiable at the endpoints. Then if the derivative is positive, if F prime is greater than zero, at every point of the open interval, then the function is increasing on the closed interval. If the derivative is negative, if the derivative is less than zero, at each point of that open interval, then the function is decreasing on the closed interval. So we require differentiability in the same sign on the open intervals. And that allows us, assuming the function is continuous on the closed intervals, when we speak of increasing and decreasing, and this follows from the definition we had above, we get to include the endpoints when we have a discussion of increasing and decreasing. The book and um, the solutions in particular are a little inconsistent on this. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna include the endpoints because that's the proper way to apply the definitions. And I might reword their questions a little bit. Uh, let's go through proof of corollary 4.3. Okay, it's based on the mean value theorem. And uh, there it is, it's surprisingly short. So suppose x1 and x2 are in the interval with x1 less than x2. 
Mean value theorem applies when I have continuity on the closed interval and differentiability on the open interval. So we'll apply the mean value theorem to the function f on the interval, closed interval, from x1 to x2. Well, that would imply uh, that f prime of c equals the difference of the function values divided by the difference of the x values, the instantaneous rate of change equals the average rate of change on that interval. That's what the mean value theorem said. Now we've cross multiplied by the x2 minus x1 and written it in this form. But that's exactly what the mean value theorem says. This holding for some number c between x1 and x2. Okay, so here's what we're looking at. Uh, and notice this involves uh, function values and how they've changed and x values and how they've changed and the derivative. Well, x2 minus x1 is greater than zero because we simply chose x2 to be greater than x1. So we get that ordering there. So if this part's positive and we've got an equality here. So I don't know in general if this is positive or negative, but whatever sign this is, f prime of c is the same sign because this is positive. So I might have positive times positive equals positive, or you might have positive times negative equals negative. No matter how you slice it, f of x sub two minus f of x sub one, the left-hand side, and this thing here, f prime of c, they're of the same sign. Yeah, either both positive or they're both negative. Uh, well, we know uh, then that if f prime is positive on the interval, then f prime of c is positive, and this is positive, which translates into f of x2 is greater than f of x1, provided f prime is positive on that interval. And that's what we get when a function is increasing. So this is the increasingness when f prime is positive. If f prime is negative, then we'll have uh, this as negative, drawing the conclusion that f of x2 is less than f of x1, under the case that f prime is negative on that interval, and that's decreasing. So that's exactly um, what we claimed. Increasing when derivative is positive, decreasing when derivative is negative. You might wanna pause the video and look up increasing and decreasing again and convince yourself that the signs of f prime, really f prime of c, yields these particular behaviors. And these are the increasing and decreasing behaviors by definition that was claimed. Let's illustrate this with an example. Uh, the book words this slightly differently using the 14th edition of the book here. They state this as find the open intervals on which this function is increasing and decreasing. I wanna change that. Um, I wanna include the endpoints of those intervals if I can, and I can. And uh, let me word it as even more general than that. Let's find the sets on which this function is increasing and, and the set on which it's decreasing. It'll be unions of intervals. Uh, the instructions I've set up here are quite specific. Use the critical points of G to make a table of the sign of G prime using test values from the intervals on which G prime has the same sign. Okay, so uh, first off, let's find the derivative. So here's G of X, differentiate, we get, uh, let's see, X to the fourth gets four X cubed, minus four X cubed, differentiate, we'll get minus 12 X squared, four X squared, differentiate, we'll give us eight X. Easy to differentiate, it's just a polynomial we'll see involved derivatives a little bitty bit now. We're gonna take derivatives and do things to them, so we probably won't have really, really complicated things to differentiate. It'll produce algebra we can't do. A uh, little trivia for you. You're really good at differentiation. Uh, the constraints aren't the calculus on this stuff. It'll be the algebra that you can't do. Neither can I. I mean, there's certain algebra that's undoable. Uh, so the algebra is more a constraint on what examples we do than the calculus is. Because we're good at differentiating. Uh, this factors, speaking of algebra, we can factor our 4x out, leaving us with 4x times x squared minus 3x plus 2. That in turn factors, foil backwards if you like, factors to x minus 1 times x minus 2. I leave it to you to dig through the little algebraic details. 
So here's the derivative. The instructions again were use the critical points of G, something, something, something. So let's find the critical points. Critical points of G are points in the domain of G where either the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. Well, the derivative is a polynomial, so it's always defined. When's it zero? Well, that's the reason we factored it. The derivative is zero when this expression is zero, so when x is zero. When this expression, this factor is zero, that is when x equals one. And when this factor is zero, that is when x equals two. So x equals zero, one, and two. These are the critical points, and they're critical points because the derivative is zero there. And that tells you the graph of the function has a horizontal tangent line at those points because derivatives are slopes of tangent lines and horizontal lines have slope zero. The derivative is zero at these points. If the derivative was undefined, that'd tell us something too. Now g prime, uh, here it is say, it is a polynomial. Polynomials are continuous. So the only way g can change from positive to negative is by going through zero. And the only way it can change from negative to positive is by going through zero. G, sorry, G prime, that was true of G as well, but G prime is a function of conversation. G prime can't change sign, S-I-G-N sign, not trig sign, can't change sign without going through zero. Says who? Well, the intermediate value theorem says that when you deal with continuous functions. So that's the calculus justification. So the only way G prime can change sign as X increases is for G prime to take on the value zero. And we know where it takes on the value zero. So what we're gonna do is take the domain of the original function G, the whole real line, and we're gonna kick out zero, one, and two, leaving us with the whole real line with those points removed. So it'll leave us with the intervals, negative infinity to zero, open, because we threw zero out, zero to one, open, because we threw zero and one out, one to two, open, two to infinity, open. So this is the whole, <clears throat> whole real line with zero removed, one removed, and two removed. All right, so from this conversation about changing sign, G prime, it has the same sign throughout this first interval, positive or negative, we have to figure out which one, has the same sign throughout the second interval, has the same sign throughout the third interval, has the same sign throughout the fourth interval. So all we need to do is pick a number, any number from, say this first interval, plug it into the derivative and see if we get a positive or a negative. If we plug a number in, we get a positive, G prime must be positive throughout that interval. We get a negative, it must be negative throughout that interval, and so forth uh, for the other three intervals. So what we're gonna do is make a little table. Here's G prime for the record. Let's look at the factored version of it. I could care less what value comes out of the derivative. I'm only interested right now in the sign of that value. So we'll take uh, the real number line and break it up into the interval negative infinity to zero, zero to one. I couldn't fit it on one long narrow table, so I have to break it up into two tables. One to two and two to infinity for the remaining intervals. So there's the four intervals. We're gonna choose a test value. Let's call it K, because I gotta call it something. Test value from this interval, let's use negative one. Use something small and um, something that's a nice number. Now, what's a nice number may depend on what function you're dealing with, as we'll see soon in some examples upcoming. Negative one's a pretty nice number for polynomials. Uh, you can't use zero, right? Zero's not in the interval because it got thrown out. If I use zero, I'm gonna get zero out of the derivative because, well, that's where the zero came from. It was a critical point of the derivative where the derivative was zero. So I can't use the endpoints in any of this depending on how the question comes to you. If the endpoint's included in the conversation, you can use the endpoint, but it's not here. So we'll pick negative one, uh, a little number, not too complicated. We'll plug that into the derivative. Okay, so what I've done is taken the derivative and we might um, speed this up a little bit in the future. This is our first one. And I'm plugging negative one in there. 
and there and there as I'm want to do. I put parentheses around the negative one that's been substituted in. Right? And the function comes with some other parentheses as well. But there's four times uh, negative one. There's negative one minus one. There's negative one minus two from these factors. Okay. I could crunch the numbers on this and see what number we get out. But you know, all that really matters is whether that number is positive or negative. This first factor, that's negative. The second factor, that's negative. It's negative two, if you like numbers, but it's negative. This factor is negative, it's negative three. And I can multiply all that stuff together and see what we get. The important thing is, I'm trying to save myself algebraic trouble, we're gonna get a negative. G prime of K will be negative something. Okay, then G prime of X, notice the careful choices of symbols here, G prime of X will, then will be negative throughout this interval. Whatever sign G prime has at negative one, same sign throughout the interval. What does the sign of the derivative tell you? Well, according to that corollary, it tells us the function is uh, decreasing or increasing. When the derivative is negative, derivative is negative here, this function is decreasing on that interval. In fact, I can include the endpoint in a conversation about decreasing this. We will here down at the bottom. The function's decreasing from negative infinity to zero. The way decreasing is defined, I get to include that, that endpoint in that interval. Next, zero to one, let's just choose one half. We'll plug it in. There's the one half, the one half, the one half in parentheses. It's been substituted into G prime. Now that first factor is positive, that second factor is negative, it's negative one half. Uh, this factor is negative, it's negative three halves. We've got a positive times two negatives, that's a positive. First derivative is positive, function's increasing. First derivative test for increasing, decreasing, the corollary. Positive derivative, increasing function. Interval from one to two, let's use three halves. We now find First factor is positive, second factor is positive, third factor is negative. Multiply positive times positive times negative, get a negative derivative, and so a decreasing function. Next interval, two to infinity, what's your favorite number? Because uh, I chose four for some reason, I wanted to choose three, uh, anyhow. Plug the four in, uh, and each of the factors is positive. Okay, uh, each of the factors is positive, the product's positive, so the derivative is positive throughout that interval, and the function is increasing throughout that interval. Uh, so, where's the function increasing? Uh, this one and this one. Zero to one and two to infinity. A careful reading of the definition of increasing says, if the function's continuous at the endpoints, it is, it's continuous everywhere, you can include them and say this function is increasing on the closed interval zero, one, union, uh, this is a closed interval as well, two to infinity, it's an interval, and it includes all its endpoint. Now it's only got one endpoint and it includes it. There is no right-hand endpoint. So this is a closed interval as well. Uh, so it's the union of these two, including the endpoints. Uh, where is decreasing? Uh, negative infinity to zero and one to two. Oh, and a careful reading of the definition of decreasing on an interval says if it's continuous, it is, G is continuous, you can include the endpoints. So the set on which the function is decreasing is as given here. The union of those two intervals, including their endpoints. A little word of warning, the book asks for open intervals in this question and they left the endpoints off. Uh, I like that book, but um, I disagree a little bit on that. And I don't think they did it this way in previous editions. Uh, it's, you can say decreasing and increasing and include the endpoints. It comes from the definition of increasing and decreasing on an interval. And I only talk about increasing and decreasing on intervals when using this derivative test. Um, what happens at one, because one's included in both of these sets, well, the derivative was zero, but on this interval, that function is increasing, and on this interval, that function is decreasing, or this interval. 
this idea of including endpoints always occurs on intervals. So beware, the book's going to leave the endpoints off. I'm going to put the endpoints on in terms of an evaluation on a test or something. I guess I could go either way. Uh, <clears throat> the best way to do it is the way I'm doing it instead of the way the book's doing it. And they used to do it this way. I suspect it's just some little editorial thing they changed for the new edition. But the important idea is we know where this is increasing and decreasing. No argument. It's doing it on these intervals. Uh, I got a slight argument saying, meh, not include the endpoints. So we know a bunch about this function. We know um, where it's increasing. We know where it's decreasing. We know what its critical points are. We could graph that function. We could graph that function. And we will graph that function, but we're gonna do some other stuff first. So I was thinking we've we got a lot of information. We could try to graph it now. We're going to get a little bitty bit more information. We don't have function values. So back to the notes, a little editorial thing there, discontinuity in the videos, just me trying to think. Okay, so uh, what we haven't talked about yet is maxes and mids. So let's do that. We're getting uh, a rather lengthy conversation out of this picture. So in blue, here's the graph of a function defined on the interval from A to B. So that's the domain of the function. Uh, the function has a positive derivative between here and here. Uh, it has a positive derivative between here and here. It has a negative derivative, uh, a positive derivative, a negative derivative, and a positive derivative, and as, as indicated. We've got a bunch of critical points, C1 through C5. C1 is a critical point because it looks like the derivative is zero there. C2 is a critical point because the derivative is zero there. They've indicated it with little red hash marks. When we finally do graph things, we'll do the same. We'll indicate with little horizontal hash marks. They kind of represent horizontal tangent lines. C3, horizontal tangent line, derivative is zero. C4, ooh, it's got uh, a corner in it, I think is what the book calls. Uh, that little problem with the derivative. Derivative is undefined at C4. The function's defined, the derivative isn't. That counts as a critical point. What it means is something's wrong with the derivative. What that something is could go a couple of different ways. There could be a corner. There could be a cusp. There could be a vertical tangent line. These are things that can go wrong with graphs when we have derivatives that are undefined. Okay, they gave us the graph this time and I can see it's what the book called a corner. It's a little sharp point uh, on the graph. At C5, the derivative is zero, so there you go. Now, I wanna discuss this in terms of um, the increasing and decreasingness. So that's the picture. We'll bounce back around between the picture and the verbiage. Critical points, uh, C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. At some of them, the derivative was zero, uh, actually all but one of them. At one of them, the derivative is undefined. It was the one labeled C4 where there was the corner on the graph. Function's differentiable, well, except at C4. Uh, the sign of the derivative is indicated in the picture. So we know from the first derivative test uh, that, that tells us about increasingness and decreasingness. We're about to formalize this as a theorem, the first derivative test for local extrema. But the first derivative test for, max, for increasing decreasing tells us the derivative is positive, the function's increasing. Yeah, so look at the picture. If the derivative is positive, the function's still increasing. Now look at this, it didn't change from positive to negative. The one example we've done on all those intervals the sign of the derivative changed every time. It doesn't have to happen. It doesn't happen in this one. The derivative is positive, then it's zero, then it's positive again. Well, that means the function was increasing. The derivative was zero, it must have leveled off. And then it increases some more, okay? And then it leveled off again where the derivative is zero. Then the derivative changed to negative and it went downhill, levels off, derivative is zero. Anything could happen after that. Looks like the derivative changes to positive. 
function changes to increasing. Ooh, critical point. Hey, look, it, it changes from increasing to decreasing at that critical point, even though the derivative wasn't zero. So these critical points will matter as well, where the derivative is undefined. The function decreases, levels off, and then it decreases some more. So we can very much interpret this stuff in terms of going uphill and downhill uh, as like a two-dimensional uh, surface, a two-dimensional topography or something. We want to find extrema, local minimums and local maximums of the function. And I mean, you can see from the picture, this is a local minimum because nearby where the function's defined, the function's bigger. This is smaller than all function values near it. Same thing holds at this endpoint. Nearby where the function's defined, the function values are bigger than they are here. These are both local minima. minima. Uh, here, we've got a local maximum. The function went up and then it went down. Well, then you get a maximum there. You, you reach the top of the mountain and then descended. Then you had a, a local maximum. There be, may be higher mountains elsewhere. That's why local. Here you descended to the bottom of a valley. You reached a minimum elevation. So there's a local minimum. And then you continue to go uphill again. Here you went uphill and then you went downhill. So there's a local maximum there. Uh, here you went downhill, you leveled off, and then you went downhill some more. So nothing in terms of a uh, max or a min there. So that gives us the list of all the local maxes and mins. And we already knew those occurred either at endpoints or at critical points. You want absolute maxes and mins? Um, I just picked the, the, the least one, which is over here, and the greatest one, which is this height over here. This is the minimum height, and this is the maximum height, if I think about this as a, like a, topography, giving elevations. So uh, how do you find the, uh, the local maxes? You go up a hill and then you go down a hill. If the function changes from increasing to decreasing, you must have reached the hilltop. If the function changes from decreasing to increasing, you must have reached the bottom of a little local valley. And that's what the first derivative test for local extrema tells you. So this puts it more explicit in terms of uh, behaviors of the signs of the derivative, but the picture you remember is one like this in figure 4.21. Here's the formal statement of the first derivative test for local extrema. We had a first derivative test for increasing and decreasing. Now we got a first derivative test for local extrema. It's based on that other first derivative test. So suppose C is a critical point of a continuous function F. So derivative is either zero or undefined, and that points in the domain of the function. That's what critical points were. Then F is, uh, oh, sorry, and assume F is differentiable at every point in some interval containing C, except possibly at C itself. Yeah, the derivative might not be defined at C. It could be that kind of critical point. Moving across this interval from left to right, if F prime changes from negative to positive at C, then F has a local minimum at C. If F prime changes from positive to negative at C, then F has a local maximum at C. If F doesn't change sign at C, that is it's positive on both sides of C or negative on both sides of C, then F has no local extremum. We'll go through proof but does it make sense? Let's check out this minimum one. F prime changes from negative to positive. Well, if F prime changes from negative to positive, what was F doing? It was decreasing and then it changed to increasing. It was decreasing and then it changed to increasing. Yeah, so you must have had a local minimum there. Here we've got the other case. F is increasing where the derivative is positive. And then F is decreasing, where the derivative is negative. So it must have had a local maximum. Here we've got increasing, critical point, increasing some more. You don't have a local anything there, no extremum. Here we've got decreasing, critical point, decreasing more. Again, no extremum. 
So that picture really contains all the information in this thing here. So there's a statement of how we can find local maxes and mins. We'll redo that, uh, that example at number 28 we were working on, and then we'll do a graph of that. Uh, let's go through a proof of this. Okay. Uh, part one. Uh, F prime changes from negative to positive at C. Claim is then F has a local minimum at C. Well, if the derivative changes from negative to positive at C, then there's numbers A and B, A less than C, C less than B, A to the left of C, B to the right of C, where F prime is negative on the interval from A to C. So coming up to C, we've got a negative derivative. They said it was negative and then it changed to positive. On the other side, between C and B, between C and B, the derivative is positive. So this is just their symbolic way of saying, on the left of C, close by at least, we had a negative derivative. To the right of C, we had a positive derivative. What happens at C? Uh, we were told we've got a continuous function. So what happens at C? Uh, functions defined because it's continuous at C. C is a critical point. Okay, the function's defined, but a critical point. Either the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. Well, that's what happens at C. And it matters. We're going to have a local, apparently we're going to have a local minimum at C. So this is one of those where it does matter what happens at C, even though the derivative may not be defined. That just makes C a critical point. If uh, we take x to be any element of the interval from a to c, then we know uh, f of x is less than f of c because f prime negative implies a decreasing function. You put in, um, in a decreasing function, you put in greater values, c is greater than x, x comes from this interval, so x is less than c, then f of x is less than f of c. It's a decreasing function greater values yield lesser, I'm sorry, how about this, greater inputs, x values, yield lesser outputs, function values. So uh, we've got then that uh, x being an arbitrary point of this interval, we've got that um, f of x is greater than f of c throughout this little interval here. Now we're going to look on the other side. What happens when we look for x between c and b? Okay, the sign of the derivative is different there. If x is between c and b, the derivative is greater than zero. That is, we got an increasing function. Now I've got x greater than c. Look where x is chosen from. Increasing function, I put in greater values. I get out greater, I'm sorry, I put in greater inputs, greater x values. I get out greater outputs, function values. C is less than X, F of C is less than F of X. That was the definition of increasing. So what we've just shown is we've got F of X is greater than or equal to C throughout the interval from A to B. Uh, that was a conclusion in both cases. So function values are greater than or equal to F of C on some interval, definition of local minimum, F has a local minimum at C. We picked up the or equals to because we never considered what happens at C and it matters what happens at C in, in this kind of question. How about part two? Well, it's the same thing except the signs change and the increasing decreasing this changes. And it's, it's the same argument and it's the same justification. Let's gloss over that. You've got access to these notes online. Um, but it, it's the same argument. So it changes um, from, what's our setting here? Changes from positive derivative to negative derivative. Okay, so that means the function's increasing and it changes to decreasing. I can choose my x values as we did before. The inequalities get respectively reversed and we can draw the conclusion that we have a local maximum at C. Uh, thirdly, 
if f prime doesn't change sign at c uh, then we've got neither a local maximum nor a local minimum well the idea is fairly similar to those previous two uh, let's consider the case where the derivative is positive on both sides so we'll do our same thing we'll go to the left of c a little bit and to the right of c a little bit We've got increasing on both sides. The conclusion will be when I choose x to the left of c, x less than c, we get f of c greater than f of x because we're dealing with an increasing function. When I choose, let's call it y this time, when I choose y greater than c and sufficiently close to c, we still got an increasing function. Now we'll get the conclusion f of c is less than f of y because c is less than y and we've got an increasing function. When I paste those two pieces of information together, we've got f of x is less than or equal to f of c is less than or equal to f of y. So f of c ain't bigger than stuff around it. it it's, uh, it's bigger than this stuff to the left, but there's not a little open interval containing c where this is a maximum. It's bigger than the stuff on the left. It's not a local minimum either, but, but it's, it's less than the stuff on the right but it's not less than stuff on both sides. And that's what a local max or a local min is. So it's neither a local max nor a min as they claimed. So there's a proof of this. Um, yeah, let's use it. Let's go back to that previous exercise and we'll do a whole pile more uh, examples. Let's go back to that previous exercise number 38 where we were looking at this function from above, we had this increasing and decreasing information. Can you use that to determine maxes and mins? We can go directly to uh, the first derivative test for local extrema and look at the sign of the derivative changing from negative to positive. I tell you what, let's look at the increasing decreasing information and determine from that whether we've got maxes or mins. That's easier to visualize. Because what you're going to do if you look at the signs of the derivative, the first thing you're going to do in your head is think increasing and decreasing. So let's go straight there. We've got the information. So on the interval from negative infinity to zero, the function's going downhill. We had reached a point where the derivative was zero, at zero, that's contained above, and then the function started increasing. Well, if it went down and then up, it must have reached a minimum. This has a local minimum at x equals zero. That minimum is g of zero. So I plug zero back into the original function and I get zero out. So minimum because it went down and then up and there's the value of that minimum. Here at one, it changed from going uphill to going downhill. So we must have reached a mountaintop at one and that's a local maximum. So it must have a local maximum at x equals one. We'll plug one into the function and see what that maximum is. The arithmetic, I guess, leads us to a value of one from the function. And at two, it went downhill and then it changed to going uphill. That's a local minimum at two. So it's got a minimum at two. We plug two into the function and it looks like we get out zero. Now let's graph it because we know a bunch of stuff about this function. We know increasing, decreasing information. We know where it has horizontal tangent lines. We know where it has critical points. Uh, here's three points on the graph. Plotting points to graph something willy-nilly is useless. Plotting points that are special points and you know why they're special, that's the way to go. That's the way you graph things. You don't just throw a table down and start throwing whole numbers into it and see what you get out. That's no way to graph anything. The way to graph something is to plot points, but plot special points and know why they're special. These three points are special. They're, they're local extrema. That's what makes them special. And between them, I know decreasing and increasing information about the function. So here's a graph. We just said on the previous slide, g of zero is zero, g of one is one, and g of two is zero. At zero, one, and two, we had a derivative of zero. So I'll, I should, could make this more dynamic, then I'll plot the points, I'll put little red hash marks at these three points because the derivative was zero there. 
We knew the function decreased over here. We knew it increased here. We knew it decreased here and we knew it increased there. So what I do dynamically is first plot the three points. They're extrema. Next, put the little hash marks down, indicating the derivative is zero there, horizontal tangent lines. Next, take care of the increasing, decreasing information. So I draw something that decreases. Q here is going to have to level off because it has a horizontal tangent line there. Derivative is zero. Comes out of here, level. Has to increase. It's got to level off again because it's got a horizontal tangent line there. It could come out of this increasing, but that's not what our information tells us. It comes from here to decreasing. Levels off again, and then it increases. So the graph of that function must look a fair amount like that. Um, how do you know the function doesn't um, maybe uh, uh, wiggle some more and do something like this over here? Well, if it did, there'd be more critical points and it wouldn't be increasing over here. It can't wiggle a whole lot like that. The first derivative would have told me all about it. That's what the first derivative test. How do you know it increases but maybe instead of increasing like this, it doesn't level off. You know what I mean, maybe it's got like a horizontal asymptote and it, it continues to increase, but maybe it levels off. Well, it doesn't, but we didn't check that. We will in the future. So there are some subtle properties of the graph that we don't know just from first derivative information. Uh, I don't know, for example, that this thing increases, you know, really steeply. Maybe it increases, but not quite so steeply. I don't know. We, we didn't check that. We simply checked increasing and decreasing. But this graph certainly satisfies all the properties that we know. And I can come up with other graphs that satisfy those properties. I can come up with graphs that violate those properties. How do you know it did this nice smooth thing here? How do you know it didn't wiggle some more? Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't have wiggled too much or that would change the decreasingness and it introduced more critical points. So I'm confident this is a pretty good graph. There's a little bit more information we'll add in the next section that'll eliminate the possibility that mm, maybe it increases but not quite so, so sharply. When we look at the second derivative, it turns out. So there's a graph using derivative information, first derivative information, using critical points, local extrema, and increasing and decreasing. Let's do more. Consider the function f defined on the interval from a to b, uh, say the interval 0 to pi, that has this derivative. Oh, these guys, we can't graph this one because they didn't tell us the function. They told us the derivative. Uh, we can still do increasing and decreasing stuff. So we get uh, f prime is sine x plus cosine x times sine x minus sine x. So I could, I could maybe foil that and some good things happen. Question is, part A, what are the critical points? Part B, on what sets is f increasing or decreasing? The book will ask you what open intervals. They ought to ask you what sets. I will. At what points, if any, does f assume local maxes and min values? Okay, they want increasing, decreasing, and local extrema. Totally a first derivative question. And they've given us the first derivative. I can't tell you um, what those maxes and mins will be because I don't know what the function is. I only know what its derivative is because that's the kind of question they ask. All right. Um, let's, let's toy with this derivative. I think I can change it into a more useful form. If we'll um, multiply out, foil this, we get the first squared minus the second squared center terms canceling out because of the, the plus cosine minus cosine nature of the thing. So we can multiply that out to get that the derivative is actually sine squared x minus cosine squared x and that might ring a distant bell. That's the negative of the double angle formula for cosine. Uh, cosine 2x is cosine squared x minus sine squared x uh, so I need to insert a negative sign to make this look like that. This is easier to deal with than what they gave us originally. So let's use this. Uh, I'm not sure if this is their intended solution. Uh, this is easier than, than fiddling around with this thing and trying to see uh, when this thing is zero. 
So let's use a double angle formula, rewrite this as given. Okay, that's a bit of a trick, but it's a useful trick. Uh, for the critical points, we'll set the derivative equal to zero. Okay, that becomes a question. When is the cosine of, uh, say, theta? When's the cosine zero? On the interval from zero to two pi, the cosine is zero at pi halves and three pi halves. And five pi halves and seven pi halves, if I go a little further, which I need to because we don't have the cosine of theta, we've got the cosine of two x. So we need to find all x's in this interval that satisfy this equation. So we consider the equation, we get that negative sign out of the way, uh, cosine two x equals zero on this interval. At pi halves, a cosine function is zero. So when two x is pi halves, we've got a critical point. When two x is pi halves, x is pi force, divide both sides by two. At three pi halves, the cosine function is zero. So I set 2x equal to 3 pi halves, divide both sides by 2, and produce this. We're not even halfway through this interval. Instead of getting two solutions in that interval, we get four because of the, the two right there. At 5 pi halves, the cosine function is zero. So I set 2x equal to 5 pi halves, implying x equals 5 pi fours. At seven pi halves, the cosine function is zero. And so we get seven pi over four as a critical point. So there's the critical points, uh, true at, um, at nine pi force. I also have the derivative is zero, but that's outside this interval. There's an infinite number of places where the derivative is zero, mercifully. They just want us to look between zero and two pi. So this is all the critical points in that interval, and that's what we're interested in. Uh, so there's the critical points on the appropriate interval. Uh, on what sets is the function increasing and decreasing? Okay, well, we're considering a function defined on the interval from zero to two pi. If you like, that's the domain of the function that they've given us. So let's take that domain as we did in the previous example and remove the critical points. So I'm going to take the closed interval from 0 to 2 pi and remove these four points here. That'll produce these five intervals here. So we went 0 uh, to uh, took pi force out, pi force to the next one, 3 pi force, removed it, 3 pi force to 5 pi force, removed it, 5 pi force to 7 pi force, removed the 7 pi force. So that gives us these five intervals on which the derivative is, in each of them, positive throughout or negative throughout. So we just got to do the test value thing and the chart thing to determine whether uh, the derivative is uh, positive or negative, say, on that first little interval. So we'll make a chart using those five intervals. I'll have to break it up over two lines again because there's so many intervals. All right, uh, and this time, hey, the endpoints are included. The zero and the two pi, they're included. They weren't critical points, they were endpoints of the domain. So I can use those. The, the function's differentiable at those points. So we can use those endpoints if you like. More often than not, you're gonna have open intervals like here, and it won't include the endpoints. This one, this one includes endpoints. Not always will you have open intervals, more often than not, but sometimes the endpoints are included. The first and last intervals include the endpoints, and we can use those. This function is differentiable at those points. Uh, the derivative was negative cosine 2x. Okay, so we'll pick a number, any number, between 0 and pi force. Let's use 0 because we can. Uh, if I couldn't, I guess I'd use pi 6 because that's a special angle. Uh, between pi force and three pi force, let's use pi halves, it's right in the middle of that. Three pi force to five pi force, well, four pi force, or pi is right in the middle of that one. And I've chosen special angles from the others as well. So it's the same protocol, speed this up a little bit, of taking these test values we've called k and plugging them into the derivative. We'll get negative cosine two times whatever the k value is we chose. We've chosen nice, 
special angles so we can actually get precise values out. I leave it to you maybe to pause the video and convince yourself that produces negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one. It change signs every time. It need not do that. The two we've done so far do that though. It, it is common, but it's not a guarantee. <clears throat> but plug in the test values, we get out these particular values. I care less if this is negative one. Uh, it's the negative part that matters and what we're doing. So we've got a negative derivative, a positive derivative, a negative derivative, a positive derivative, a negative derivative. And that tells us that the function itself is decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, respectively. So uh, where's the function increasing? That was the question on what sets is the function increasing. It's increasing here and here. That's pi force to three pi force. It's an interval union five pi fours to seven pi fours. The union of those, of those two intervals, I say including the endpoints. The book may leave those endpoints out. They ought to include them. Uh, how about increasing? Oh, sorry, how about decreasing? Uh, the first one, uh, the third one, and the last one. So it'll be this interval, this interval, and this interval, I say, along with their endpoints. Um, so including the endpoints, we get uh, these, this for the set on which the function is increasing and decreasing. Is that all they asked? Wasn't there a part C about extrema? We're good to go, thinking in terms of going uphill and downhill to find extrema. Here's that information that was at the um, last of the previous slide. And the last part of the question was, at what points, if any, does F assume local max and min values? Okay, well, we want to think about it going uphill and then downhill. Uh, and I want to choose these intervals in order. Uh, here's the first one, here's the second one, here's the third one, here's the fourth one, here's the fifth one. So it's decreasing, it goes downhill and then it changes to uphill. So it's got a minimum where it switches over at pi fours, as a local minimum at pi fours. It's increasing up to x equals three pi fours, and then it changes to decreasing after that. So it went uphill and then it went downhill. So where it changes over at three pi fours, it has a local maximum, local maximum at three pi fours. Next, it's decreasing until it reaches five pi fours where it changes to increasing. So it went down and then up, that's a local minimum at five pi fours. At seven pi fours, it's changed from increasing to decreasing, reached a mountain top. And so that's a local maximum. So that takes care of all of the, um, all those critical points. Let's also look at the endpoints. We, we mentioned this when we showed that first figure before we stated um, the first derivative test for local extrema, I think it was. What's happening at zero? Well, the function decreases from zero to pi fours. So whatever value the function takes on at zero, it goes downhill from there. So at zero, this function has a local maximum because it decreases after zero and it isn't defined before zero. At the other end point, I have to think of this one differently because this one is a right-hand end point. On the interval from seven pi fours to two pi, the function was decreasing. So now it's going downhill when it reaches that right-hand endpoint, two pi, it'll have a local minimum because it goes downhill to reach that local minimum. And it's undefined beyond there. The domain of the function was zero to two pi. I'd like to draw you a picture, but I can't plot points because they didn't tell us the function. They told us the derivative of the function. All right, I think I got a, actually a little typo here, the Sharid F prime. They had given us the derivative uh, of the function. So they didn't give us the function, so we're stuck uh, in terms of um, not being able to plot points. Let's do another one here. There, they gave us the function on this one. Find the sets on which this function is increasing and decreasing and do your thing with a table. Find critical points and take the sign of uh, G prime. Identify local uh, and absolute extreme values, if any, and uh, they didn't ask us to graph it. Let's graph it because we'll have lots of information by the time we've done these things. All right, uh, here's the function. 
Uh, by the way, the domain of the function, all real numbers, no problems here. We'll need to take cube roots. I can take cube roots of zero and negatives. So no, no problems with that. So the domain is all real numbers, by the way. G prime. Okay, I'll need a product rule because it's a product of two functions. We'll have the derivative of x to the two-thirds. Two-thirds x to the negative one-third. Derivative of the first times the second, x plus five. Plus the first, x to the two-thirds, times the derivative of the second, derivative of x plus five is one. Simplify, let me just skip over to this point and say getting a common denominator, adding those together, simplifying if necessary, we get this. So we get 5x plus 10 divided by 3 times the cube root of x, 3 times x to the one-third. Can anything go wrong with the derivative or can the derivative be zero? So looking for critical points, uh, negative 2 is a critical point. That makes the derivative zero. G prime of negative two equals zero. Numerator is zero. Denominator is defined. So I don't care what it is. The numerator is zero and the denominator is defined. We get zero out. So x equals negative two is a critical point because the derivative is zero there. Uh-oh, we got this x to the one third in the denominator. X equals zero is a critical point, but for a different reason. G prime is not defined at x equals zero. Critical points were points in the domain of the function, domain of this function is all real numbers, where either the derivative was zero, like at negative two, or the derivative was undefined, like at x equals zero. So this illustrates what happens when we have an undefined derivative at a point in the domain of the function, that kind of critical point. All right, so two critical points. Uh, negative two and zero, you know, keep the order in mind because we're going to take the domain of that function, negative infinity to infinity, and remove negative two and zero. That'll produce these three intervals. So we'll make a chart containing these three intervals. We'll pick a test value. Let's use negative three. Let's use negative one and positive one. Use zero if you can, because arithmetic's easy with zero. You can't, zero's excluded these, from these intervals. They're open intervals. This time, they're open, all of them. Plug those test values into the derivative. It was five x plus 10 divided by three x to the one third. So plug the negative three in. Uh, you know, all I really care about is the sign. As before, I may not perform all this arithmetic. I'm just looking for a positive or negative sign. I plug um, negative three in, we'll get negative 15 plus 10, that's negative five, there's a three, it's negative five over three, put in the negative five that results from the numerator, divided by this three. And then in the denominator, we also get a uh, negative three to the one third. What's negative three to the one third? I don't know, it's negative, that's all that matters. That's the negative cube root of three. Uh, but anyhow, the denominator's negative and the numerator's negative. Okay, so the quotient's positive, and that's what mattered. If the quotient, uh, if the derivative is positive, then the function itself, g, is increasing. Plug in negative one. Similar, ana similar analysis yields a negative derivative. The function's decreasing where the derivative is negative. Plug in positive one. We get out a nice clean number of five. Who cares? It's positive is all that matters. The derivative is positive, and so the function is increasing. Where is the function increasing? The first interval and the last interval, including the endpoints, I say. Where's the function decreasing? On the center interval, including the endpoints, I say. So uh, let's see, that takes care of the increasing, decreasing stuff. They ask us about extrema. Well, we know where, where it increases and decreases. Actually, let's go back and look at the chart. It goes up and then down and then up. Okay, if it went up and then uh, x was what, negative two here? That must be a local maximum at negative two. Then it went down, x is zero over here. That'll be a local minimum and then it went up. So maximum at negative two, the point that was thrown out here, minimum at zero because of the increasing, decreasing information. If you like, technically, it's from the first derivative theorem for local extrema based on the signs. Think increasing, decreasing. So we have a local maximum at negative two. 
We have a local minimum at zero, as we just said. It's the first derivative test that justifies that. Think increasing, decreasing, though. Um, let's plug in negative two and see what we get out. Looks like we get out following the arithmetic, three on the cube root of four. All right. Plug zero in, uh, get zero out. So there's that minimum. That gives us two points to plot. And let's look at the graph. They ask about absolute extrema as well. Let's look at the, bra the graph and I'll try to talk you into the fact that it has no absolute extrema. Okay, so let's see. At negative two, we got out uh, this value, possibly not the scale. So I didn't do use software to, to graph this accurately. I just use, I use PowerPoint uh, to get something that has the right shape, as you'll do when you work them by hand. So at negative two, we get out some positive value, three on the cube root of four, whatever that is. It's, uh, I don't know, it's bigger than three because the cube root of four is bigger than one. Um, and let's see, at zero, we got out zero. The derivative was zero here, so I'm putting a little horizontal hash mark here. The image is small, but the derivative was undefined down here, and I put a little tiny vertical red hash mark there. Vertical hash mark to indicate the derivative is messed up for some reason. Let's see what we get. Uh, you wanna plot any other points? Uh, here's the function. Uh, at zero, we get out zero. And at negative five, we get out zero. Let's plot the intercepts. So that gives this point. Uh, we actually already had this point for other reasons. I know the function is increasing here. So it must do something like this. Got to level off here, because the hash mark would tell me about that. Derivative is zero, critical point. Has a local maximum. Changes over to decreasing. Decreases down to zero. Changes from decreasing to increasing. And the derivative was undefined. So it didn't decrease and level off nice and smooth. If it did, the derivative would have been zero. Derivative was undefined. Something's wrong with a graph at that point in a sense of a derivative, it must have a sharp point, it must have a cusp, maybe a vertical tangent. I don't know, I'll put a sharp point in it and that'll, that'll take care of it. Uh, we didn't analyze it to that degree, but something's wrong and I can't talk about slopes of tangent lines. It did not come down and level off or the derivative would have been zero. It came down, it must have some kind of sharp point in it. We didn't analyze it to that depth. We probably have the knowledge to do so now, but we got enough on our plate. And then it changed to increasing. Local max, local min. Any absolute maxes and mins? Well, this couldn't be an absolute minimum because you know it's zero over here and you know it's increasing over here, so it must have increased up to zero. This function's unbounded below. It's also unbounded above. Uh, you should believe that by making X really big, you can make G of X really big, uh, bigger than that at least. So this is not a, an absolute maximum. It's, I bet you it's unbounded to the right and it's unbounded to the left. And this actually has no absolute extreme. It doesn't have an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum, but it does have two local maxes and two local mins. That I'm happy with. This last argument was a little soft and in terms of details, but it is true. Another function with a logarithm in it. Find the open intervals on which this function is increasing and decreasing. Yeah, man, I wish I'd have said find the sets on which this function is increasing and decreasing. This is the book's terminology, so I just copied it from the book. Use the critical points to, you know, determine the signs of uh, F prime as we've been doing, make a little chart, and identify local and absolute extreme values. Okay. Uh, the domain of this function is zero to infinity. You can take X squared, and do that to any real number, log. You can only take logarithms of positive numbers. So you have only keep positive numbers. You can't take the log of zero. You can't take logs of negatives. You won't ever take logs of zeros. There's a way to define logs of negatives using complex numbers, but that's not our problem. So the domain of the function is zero to infinity. Uh, we'll find the critical points and remove them from this interval and then make our chart. The derivative, 
Uh, product of two functions, we'll need derivative of the first, 2x times the second, log x plus the first, x squared times the derivative of log x, 1 over x. Uh, this simplifies to x. This is uh, 2x log x. If I factor the x out, maybe write it in a different order, we get this for the derivative. Okay, I want to see where the derivative is zero and where the derivative is undefined for x values in the domain. I mean, this, this derivative is not defined at zero, but that doesn't count as a critical point because zero is not in the domain of the function. Critical point was a number in the domain of the function where the derivative was zero or undefined. So that'll have an impact on what the critical points are. For the critical points, we'll take that derivative. Uh, we see that f prime of x equals zero is satisfied when this term is zero, but this term isn't zero. The only time that's zero is when x is zero and you can't use x equals zero. It's not in the domain of the function. x equals zero is not in the domain of the function. So that doesn't contribute a critical point. It's not even in the domain of the function. It's not a critical point. But I can make one plus two log x equal to zero. If we set one plus two log x equal to zero, we get log x is negative a half. Sure, if log x is negative a half, this will be one plus two times negative a half. It'll be one minus one. Now we'll get zero out that way. I need to solve this for x. We did some of this back in chapter one. Exponentiate both sides using a natural exponential. That'll get rid of the log. We get e to the log x equals e to the negative one half. Well, e to the log x is x itself, composition of inverse functions. Right hand side, uh, well, what are you going to do? Uh, is x to the negative one half. So that's the only critical point. That's where the derivative is zero on the domain of the function. There are no points in the domain of the function where the derivative is undefined. And there's plenty of places where the derivative is undefined, but there are also points where the function itself is undefined. Yeah, if the function ain't defined, the derivative ain't going to be defined either just why you restrict your attention early on to the domain of the function. Okay, so we ended up with one critical point where the derivative was zero. And it's this awkward point here, e to the negative one half. So I have to think about the behavior of the exponential function when choosing test values. So what we'll do is take the domain of the function, zero to infinity, and we'll remove that one critical point at e to the negative one half. That's one over the square root of e, approximately. Fiddle with your calculator and you convince yourself of the following. Uh, but think, hey, the exponential function, you know what the exponential function looks like? It grows exponentially. It's an increasing function. So when I put bigger numbers in, I get bigger numbers out. So when I put negative one half into the exponential function, we get this end point. If I want something less than that, well then uh, exponentiate something less than negative a half. How about negative three fourths? You want something bigger than that? Exponentiate something bigger than negative one half. How about zero? E to the zero is one. So I get a nice number there. Here, let's choose e to the negative three fourths. That's, think about the graph of the exponential function. That's less than e to the negative one half. Um, so it, uh, indeed, it's in there. All right. Um, so plug that in. We had x, one plus two natural log of x for the derivative. Substituting in, we get the, we get this thing here. I know exponential functions are never negative, so I, I don't know precisely what this value is. Nobody does, but it's positive, and that's what matters. Uh, one plus two natural log e to the negative three-fourths. Oh, uh, dude, the natural log of e to the negative three-fourths is negative three fourths, composition of inverse functions again. A lucky lad, I chose e to some power because it makes evaluating this log function uh, straightforward. So the log of e to the negative three fourths is negative three fourths, multiply by two, and it give you um, negative three halves. So we've got e to the negative three fourths as the first factor, need an equal sign here. Second factor is um, one minus, the negative came from here, three halves. That's negative, that's positive, the product's negative, the function's decreasing.
Over here, we use one, natural log of one is zero, the value is one, one is positive, the function's increasing over there. So we get uh, decreasing and then increasing, and I followed the books protocol on this one. I guess that's a good thing. Uh, it's increasing on this interval, it's decreasing on that interval. I can include this endpoint here, this negative one half, I could include that endpoint. It, it's increasing on the interval, including its endpoint. And I could include the endpoint over here that's in the domain. I could include the right hand endpoint and we could claim it's uh, decreasing on that set as well. Can't include zero, remember the function's not defined at zero. Uh, so uh, for the sake of variety, we'll do this one the book's way and tell you about uh, open intervals. So we get this kind of increasing and decreasing information. Uh, knowing these guys, they ask us as well about maxes and mins. Okay, um, we know the function uh, decreases and then, and then increases. So it went down and then it went up, must have a local minimum. So it has a local minimum at e to the negative one half. That minimum is, uh, well, we'll plug e to the negative one half into the function and it looks like it produces this value here, negative one divided by two e. Uh, so there's the minimum. Uh, we'll leave it at that and exploring this one. We've asked the answered the questions they asked. There's a, got a log function in it. It's probably got a vertical asymptote somewhere. We'll look at vertical asymptotes before we're done with this section. Um, but remember what a, the graph of a logarithm looks like. This is not just a logarithm, but it's got a logarithm in it, which means it's probably got vertical asymptotes somewhere. I bet you it's at zero. Let's do another one. Okay, this one's got some vertical asymptotes in it. They say consider this, this function, this rational function, on the interval negative two to one. Identify the local extreme values of g, say where they occur. Which of the extreme values, if any, are absolute? All right, you know the routine now. This is a rational function. Uh, we get zero at negative two and at positive two in the denominator, look, look what's going on here. Positive two is not our problem, but negative two is the boundary of our problem. At negative two, this has a vertical asymptote. Yeah, it's got one at positive two as well, but I don't want to talk about that one. Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem will tell you the limit as we approach negative two from the positive side of this function will give us out uh, plus or minus infinity. Uh, I'd have to crunch the numbers to see which it is. That means this function has a vertical asymptote at x equals negative two. The function either goes up to positive infinity or down to negative infinity, to infinity. Um, gee, the increasing decreasing information will tell us that. So let's not, cr let's not grind through that one-sided limit stuff. We, we've done that before, there's nothing we can't do. Uh, we haven't formally defined vertical asymptotes yet. I think that's upcoming in a section or two, and we'll define it in terms of certain kinds of limits. I think. No, no, I take it back. We have defined vertical asymptotes. That was back when we did the, the last section of chapter two, I think. Yeah, so I'm good in saying we've got a vertical asymptote here. Does it go up or down? We'll figure that out from increasing, decreasing information, but we do have other ways of doing it. Let's take the derivative. Okay, it's a quotient. So here comes a quotient rule. Derivative of the numerator times the denominator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator over the denominator squared, all my square brackets, simplify, and that will produce 8x over 4 minus x squared squared. Where on the set we're interested in is this zero and where is it undefined? At x equals zero, x equals zero is in the set we're interested in. We've got a critical point because the derivative is zero there. And that's the only critical point here. Uh, this derivative, it's got some problems at negative two. We're not interested in negative two. It's got some problems at positive two. It's that same problem. We've got division by zero at both of those points. But we're not interested in negative two and two. Negative two catches my eye. I made this vertical asymptote comment. They didn't ask us to graph it. Eh, we'll graph it anyhow. We, we'll know a lot about it by the time we're done with this problem. But we've got the derivative. Uh, there's one critical point, zero. 
uh, in this interval of discussion. So we'll take that interval, we'll remove zero and make one of our charts. So take the interval from negative two to one as described, remove zero. That'll give us the interval negative two to zero, open interval and the interval zero to one, excluding the zero, no reason to exclude the one though. We take the domain and remove the critical points. Sometimes endpoints are critical points, sometimes they're not. That gives us these two intervals. All right, this one's not as messy as that last one because there's no um, like exponential functions or anything. So pick a number, any number between negative two and zero, of course, pick negative one. Pick a number or any number between zero and one. Can I use one, can I use the endpoint? Usually not, but I can this time, it's included. So let's use one. If that bugs you, use a half. You can use any number you want in this interval. Of course, the arithmetic is easiest with one, and I can use one this time because one's included in that interval, though that is fairly rare. Plug these numbers in, produces a negative value and a positive value. I leave it to you to convince yourself the arithmetic is correct. That means the function having a negative derivative is decreasing on this interval, having a positive derivative is increasing on that interval. So decreasing and increasing information we have. They ask us about extrema. Well, the function goes down and then it goes up, so it must have a local minimum at zero. We'll plug zero into the function. We'll get zero out. Right, no problems with division by zero. We get zero over four at zero. So that's a local minimum. Uh, oh, we've got the endpoint over here, so I forgot about that. Uh, the function is increasing, say on the interval from zero to one. I can talk about including the endpoint in this case, uh, but what happens at that endpoint? Well, it increases until it stops at x equals one. So it must have a local maximum at x equals one. Plug one into the function, I guess it gives you the value one third. So that answers what they asked. They wanted um, local maxes and local mins. They wanted the extreme values. Oh, which of these are um, absolute extrema? Uh, let's look at the graph. Well, yeah, let's look at the graph. Let's come back to this slide. Here's what we know. Uh, we had a minimum here of zero, derivative was zero, little red hash mark, only critical point. Has a vertical asymptote over here. Uh, at one, we got out the value one third it's an even function. I'll also get out the value one third at negative one. I've plotted another point for, for fun, for symmetry's sake, I guess. We know the function's decreasing and has a vertical asymptote. Well, if it's decreasing and has a vertical asymptote, it must look like this. It must come down, level off, change to increasing. Got a local maximum here, a local minimum here. But if it's got this vertical asymptote, it doesn't have an absolute maximum. And looking at the graph, I can see this must be a local minimum. I'm sorry, an absolute minimum as well as a local minimum. So the graph must look something like this. You know, it's got a uh, it's got a vertical asymptote over here at two as well. If I'll take this this piece of it and reflect it about uh, the y-axis, that would produce something that has an asymptote over here. That's what the graph looks like. If it had a larger domain, right? They 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 chopped it off at one. That was their doings. Uh, but there is a symmetry to this thing if we graphed more of it, and the graph must look a lot like that. Uh, so what did we decide? Absolute minimum, no absolute maximum. Uh, and that's explained here in terms of the increasing and decreasingness and the um, ab the absence of an absolute maximum and the presence of an absolute minimum. Explained here in terms of increasing and decreasing. Really, it comes out better from the picture. But all that information is consistent. Okay, this one, uh, I think is the last one, uh, is actually uh, not so hard. They give you, they've given you information and ask you to draw a function that has the appropriate maxes and mins. Uh, cool, they gave us the information. We don't have to go computing a bunch of stuff. That's what it amounts to. They say, sketch the graph of a function y equals f of x that has a local minimum at one, one, 
and a local maximum at 3-3. Three, three. And then they, they flop it around and interchange the maxes and the mins. But they keep the points as 1-1, one, 3-3. One, three, three. I, I failed to read the word differentiable. So I want a function that's, uh, among other things, is continuous. And it doesn't have any corners or, or cusps to it. All right. First one, they wanted uh, at the point one one, they want a mac a minimum, and at three three, they want a maximum. Okay, we'll have it go down here, level off. So I could put a little horizontal hash mark there if I was so possessed. And it changes to increasing, it levels off, and there you go. I made a comment here. I'm gonna make f of x as simple as I can by minimizing the number of critical points. I can do this one with just two critical points uh, at the extrema. And it's gonna have critical points at the extrema. It might have some other ones as well. Uh, I, I could put more in, right? It could come down here and have a local minimum, go up here and have a local maximum, and then I can make it wiggle a whole bunch and it have a bunch of maxes and mens and a bunch of critical points. Well, these would still be the, the local maxes and mens as claimed. So in that sense, I'm trying to simplify the graph. Part B, they want a local maximum at 1-1 one, one, and a local minimum at 3-3. Three, three. Okay, we'll have it increase and then decrease. That'll give the local maximum. I gotta turn around and go back up, so I have to put another critical point in. But I want a minimum this time at x equals 3. So I'm gonna have to go past that, turn around, come back down, and do that kind of thing. Here's a local minimum. Here's a local maximum. They want it exactly that min and max, right and left points. Uh, part C, they want a maximum uh, at both of them. Okay, we'll go up here, have to, have to increase and then decrease. Turn around, go back up, increase, and then decrease. So I've done it with a minimum number of critical points. It took an extra one to get the wiggling to work out. And finally, a minimum at both of them, have a decrease, minimum, Go up, we have to go past there so it can turn around and decrease down and then increase afterwards. So there's examples of functions satisfying given information related to the graph. And yes, that's the last thing. So that completes uh, our applications of the first derivative to local extrema. I really got my eyes on graphing more than this local max, local min stuff. Uh, I see the goal is getting the graph. You got the graph, you've got loads of information. Uh, but we can use just derivative information to find local maxes and local mints. We've seen um, graphs where I could say, like in our first example in the supplements, it's a pretty good graph, I think. But there's some subtle things about the graph I'm not that confident in. So there's some more stuff we'll explore. And in the next section, we'll use information about the second derivative to get an idea about this more subtle information of the shape of a graph. Have a nice day. I will see you soon in section 4.4, uh, applications of the second derivative. Bye-bye.